Hey, welcome to the Father Effect Show. Today's guest is a good buddy of mine named Brian Hackney. What's up, Hack? What's going on, John? Good to be with you, brother. Dude, I appreciate you taking this time, man. I know you guys got a lot going on. There's a lot of digital counseling going on. Tell my audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I uh, for the last 21 years, I've worked full time at Cross Timbers Church in Argyle. And, you know, we've been a multi-site church and all that. And and uh, but one of the, the one of the coolest things is I've gotten to stay at our home base in Argyle at a place called the Healing Place. That's uh, basically an in-house counseling center. And we offer free counseling services for people, not just in our church, but in the community as well. Um, it's a paid ministry by the tithe or the donations of the Cross Timbers family. And so I've had the privilege of sitting with now over 900 couples um, uh, over the last basically 15 years full time in, in my tenure there at Cross Timbers. And we did a conservative uh, estimate and added up about 13,000 hours I've spent with families um, dealing with uh, marriage issues, family issues, infidelity, depression, anxiety, addiction, you know, you name it, you know, we're all struggling, right? And our church, we always say it's okay not to be okay. Uh, and we don't want to send people out there to get their help. We want to be able to help them. Um, and what we found is most people actually go to, and I hate to use the word clergy, but they go to a spiritual family or a church first when they're seeking help, not a clinician, not a therapist. And so we want to be able to, you know, help the next person that comes along. And now, man, with COVID and with everything that's going on in our world, uh, with the pandemic, the election, and, you know, social media, uh, the, uh, matter of fact, I was talking to a guy today, earlier today, I don't even want to use the word mental health. Uh, basically, it's mental unhealth, right? Uh, the, the norm is mental unhealth. I mean, we're all dealing with some form of mental unhealth because of the world we're living in. Uh, if you're alive today, you're not unscathed, right? And so we're just trying to help people with all those issues. Well, and I know, you know, me and you connected early on, especially with the father effect stuff. And you jumped on board because you, we had the conversation. You said, you know, most people that I'm dealing with, after it's all said and done, peeling back that onion, a lot of them have this father thing. And so, um, you know, with you and when we got to go up and interview Eldridge and everybody for the movie, we'll get into that in a minute, I guess. But tell people, okay. let's dive into your own story, because I know you've got an amazing story, inspirational story about anger and how you overcame anger, but, but give, give people a little bit of idea of your story and how that all came together for you. Yeah. So basically if you look at my childhood, I had a fairly good childhood, you know, no, wasn't bullied and didn't have any abuse and not really any trauma. And so, you know, as Richard Rohr says in Falling Upward, that's a really good place to start, you know, with that much order, you know, not in the chaos. But man, my container was pretty solid as far as my ego, right? And that was the problem because, man, I had it all together. You basically, you know, good grades, good athlete. You know, parents said, you're the best, you're the brightest, you're the greatest and the prettiest and, you know, all of that stuff, right? Well, so... Fast forward, I'm dating a girl out at ACU, and um, bottom line is things just did not add up. Start, she, she, I started finding out that she was, um, I mean, really long story short, she had been lying to me. And once I started figuring out there was all these lies, I ended the relationship. And when I did that, John, you'd think, man, you dodged a bullet, dude, and you went on down the road, so you'd be, you know, emotionally pretty healthy there. But you know what happened is after I ended the relationship, basically people came out of the woodwork, my friends, people I didn't even know saying, Oh my gosh, dude, you didn't know. I can't believe you were with that girl. And basically started telling me all these things she was doing behind my back. And I knew that she had been lying, but I had no idea the extent of it. I mean, she had cheated on me multiple times with multiple people. Uh, she was doing drugs and uh, drinking and I mean, all this stuff that I had, I was clueless about. 
And to say I was devastated is the understatement. Uh, it, it was a shock to my ego. Uh, I was embarrassed. I became so ashamed at what everyone knew but me, right? And uh, because that had never, ever happened to me, you know, growing up or in, a, in previous relationships, I was so ashamed of that, but I, I, I wasn't going to talk to anybody about it. You didn't okay? really know and how so, to process it, right? I, I really didn't. And you know what, John? Again, you just go on down the road. And like I said, it'd be one thing if, you know, you get dumped. But, but, but when you kind of are the one to end the relationship, you think, okay, man, like I said, bullet dodge. But I didn't know the damage that that had done. And so I'll, I'll unpack it. So fast forward, I meet Jamie, you know, we start dating, we get married eventually. And early in my marriage, this, what I'll call a betrayal wound now, as, I, as I've learned to call it, started rearing its head. And so when Jamie would be late and I didn't know where she was, uh, when she's talking a little bit too long to another male, you know, when she acts like she's really enjoying herself with in the company of other men or who are you looking, you know, I'm looking over my shoulder at a restaurant. Who, oh, looks like you guys are in the insecurity, the jealousy, uh, which turned into control. If I can control you, you won't hurt me. Right. And really what the, at its worst day, rage, just turning into starting fights over nothing because I was covering the deep internal wound, um, it felt weak to say I'm insecure. It felt weak to say, I don't know if I'm lovable. See, that was the insidious lie. It's not just, well, if someone else cheated on me, you will too. That's one concern and that's the crazy brain that turns on in men who've been betrayed or cheated on or abandoned or left. And this can be by a woman, it can be by a father, you know, but, the insidious lie is there's something wrong with me. And if I were better, more, you know, adequate, better looking, you know, what more lovable, what have you, uh, more valuable, more worth, then they wouldn't have done that. And so that insecurity uh, was, was basically an identity in me. And so, I projected all of that onto Jamie concerned that she's going to leave me too. You're going to love someone else too. And so because that feels so weak, that insecurity that I'm not lovable, men don't want to feel weak. And so we explode. So our default covering that becomes anger. And, you know, you hear people say anger is covering fear, sadness, or shame. Well, I had a lot of shame and I had a lot of fear. Not as much, you know, sadness, and, and, but, but that fear that someone's going to, she's going to leave me, and the shame that I'm not lovable. You know, dude, and, and I can see, especially as a man, that just trying to process that, yeah, and like you said, there, who do you go to? Who, who do you go to uh, your buddies to go, oh, dude, I, uh, you know, I'm fearful, I'm ashamed, you know, guys, we just don't have those conversations. Unfortunately, we should have that guy we can go to and have those conversations, but most of us don't. So I, I get over and be above all the other stuff. There's that deeper piece of, as a man, what it does to your ego and your pride. Yeah. And I think for me, I had to, you know, I mean, how it happened was after another knockdown drag out fight, I just knew, you're starting this same fight over and over and over again because of your insecurity and your weakness. And, and I'd never, ever thought of that. I'd never processed that. I just knew, you know, you have to be the problem here because my life had been charmed up to now. And all of a sudden our marriage is falling apart and it can't be me. You know, this has got to be you. And when I finally said, God, if you're real, if you're, you know, I'd, Again, with my performance mentality, which I'll come back to as far as growing up, but that whole, you have to perform for love, you know, uh, you know, I was lettering in Christianity. So God was lucky to have me on his team. Right. And so, 
I, you know, I went to church every time the doors were open, leader in the youth group and all that kind of thing. And so I knew that I was saved going to heaven because I was, man, keeping all the rules, basically. I never knew what a personal relationship with Jesus even looked like. And, you know, to be filled with the spirit of God, you have to be empty of you, right? You have to be empty yourself first to be filled with anything. And I was, I was full of not only myself, I was full of a lot of crap, right? And so when I finally said, God, if you're real, if you're out there, I remember, like, if you're there, I need you. I need help. And this was after a just just being very depressed and thinking, you know, I had ruined my marriage and, and thinking it was probably over. And I just remember the way God just came in that night and said, okay, man, you've got a huge, huge wound. Um, you know, you're not some bad guy. You're not unlovable. You're just broken and you're hurt and you're wounded and you're taking it out on the one you love the most. So and was so, there a breaking yeah. point? Was that, was there one just really big argument or blow up that took you to that point where you said, okay, God, if you're there, come help. Yeah. And, and you knew, I couldn't even tell you what it was over. It was just, it was the pattern of what had happened over and over and over. And then we we kiss and make up and everything be great until the next time I felt insecure and then it would come out again. And so it was finally just this revelation. Um, I, I can honestly say it was when I thought, you know what, my wife can't stand me and we're headed for a divorce. And I knew the last thing I wanted was to lose her love. And the last thing I wanted was to, you know, lose my marriage and, and for my wife to, to leave me. So it was like, dude, you gotta, you can't keep doing this. You have to figure this out or you're going to lose uh, the most important thing that's ever happened to you. And <clears throat> so not only did God heal my marriage, but I found out who God was. <laughs> you know, it's the first time I truly had this, started this relationship with God. And, but, but during that process of healing, so once you realize, wow, when we're blowing up, it's not about what you're blowing up over. It's something else. And so God skilled me basically in going back and looking at things that I'd never processed. Like, like you just said, never taking the time to grieve that hurt. You know, when you're full of pride, you know, you're not supposed to hurt. You know, you're supposed to be good. I'm good. And it's like, no, that hurt. And like I said, am I afraid? Am I sad? Am I ashamed? And so I, I began to, during that time, you know, we went to counseling. I admitted I need help. Like I'm a, I'm a train wreck. And so the counselor, the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, with my wife's grace and forgiveness, even she helped me go back and process some wounds that I was too, basically too proud to ever admit to in the past. And that led me to some significant wounds that I had growing up that I, I didn't even know I had, you know, uh, you and I talked before it, it's that mm, I was at a deal called Kairos, um, over at gateway church, uh, kind of going through, uh, past wounds and hurts. And I remember asking the question during one of these quiet times, God, when did I start believing a lie about myself? And like at the time, man, I was in my early forties. And he flew me back to when I was in third grade. And all of a sudden I'm standing there in the doorway of my dad's home office. And I had been the star in the school play that night and I'd forgotten my lines and in the play. And I remember my parents were always so proud when I, would, you know, I was the star and I'd make the straight A's. I'd get the medallions and the ribbons and I was the athlete. And, you know, I would get the parts in the musicals or the plays or, you know, <laughs> whatever. And they would always, the photo op after the deal, they'd want to walk with me and, and take pictures with me. Well, this particular night, I forgot my lines. And I remember my parents were out of there. I remember kind of walking down the hall, chase, almost chasing them out to the car. I'm like, wow, are they embarrassed of me? Are they not proud of me? Feeling like a failure. I'd screwed up. I was embarrassed. Well, so I'm standing there. That, so during this Kairos moment, I remember standing in the doorway of my, of my father's home office. And I, I don't even, I can't tell you why I went in there, John. I'm sure I'm just wanting to connect like, dude, you still love me? And he spun his chair around and looked at me and he said, son, 
he had this, you know, frown look on his face, said, if you ever forget your lines, don't just stand there looking like a dumbard. You need to look over the people's heads and collect your thoughts, and then your lines will come to you. And, man, it just, it crushed me. I'm like, see, I knew it. I knew it. My dad's ashamed of me. He called me some name I've never even heard. <laughs> yeah, dumbard? What is that? Dumbard. I'm like, so, so never before had I heard that name and never after. But you know what I figured out as God revealed to me these things? So this was God saying, here's where you started believing a lie about yourself. The lie is you have to perform for love. You're not good enough just as you are. You have to be perfect. You cannot mess up or you will lose love. And that started this perfectionist performance mentality that erected a poser, an imposter, my shadow self that I was always, you know, I had the wall up. It was always uh, in front. And man, you know, if, if I ever came close to not being perfect, which again, that's, that's basically all the time, I was just on the verge of a breakdown totally anxiety because I'm going to lose love or I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to feel ashamed. And so I was just on high alert my whole life until I finally could admit, man, I'm full of crap and I need help and I'm no better than anybody else. And by the grace of God, you know, I'm a sinner saved by his grace and I'll take as much grace as I can give because I need it because I'm never perfect. So, Amen. so I go back to that word, you know, dumber. I just remembered, okay, not only, it has to be some derivative of dumb, right? <laughs> but, but it was interesting. I thought, like, that wasn't a normal word that was used. And when it came out, I, I, God literally revealed to me later, wow, I wonder when my dad was called that name by his father. You know, and that, that name that, 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 that was spoken over him, that stuck, and here it comes out. And that's basically a picture of the generational, you know, curse, the generational wounds that can happen. And when God in his kindness revealed to me, man, that's when you started believing that you need to, to perform for love. He said, here's the truth. You're loved as you are, not as you should be, because you'll never be as you should be. I love you as you are. I created you in my image and I said it is good. And you know what? The truth will set you free. And I feel like he spoke the truth to me that day. And it started me on a journey, man, uh, which I've been on, you know, and it's like this, these layers of healing, right? And it's so cool. Now, John, if I start feeling angry, I don't just think I'm pissed off at fill in the blank. I go back now. My, my you know, again, the skill is that you can learn to do. Every man can, every woman can. What am I feeling? What's underneath the anger? And I guarantee you, if you really look at it, you'll find there's fear, there's shame, or there's sadness. You know what, too, dude? I just had this conversation with somebody um, about this whole concept. And matter of fact, I just had a conversation with one of my daughters. It was just one of those one-on-one -on -one conversations, and we were talking about just anger in general. And I was telling her about the time that I've gotten anger, angry at my kids, you know, and, and we were talking about it. And I said, you know, here's the thing. Honestly, when I've got angry, and I think there was one instance we were talking about when I lashed out and said, you know, got angry. And I said, that does everything to do with you. That's me and my junk. That's my stuff Good. of unworthiness, shame, guilt, all the stuff that I still as a 52-year-old man is struggling and dealing with at times. Yeah. But it's trying to even let my daughters understand this has nothing to do with you. This is dad and his own junk. But it, it, because so much of it, I think, for all of us, if we look back at that, especially with us as guys, and I think even, even from a parenting fatherhood standpoint, sometimes we get mad at our kids because there's something they didn't know. But deep down, we know we didn't teach them what yeah. they didn't know. So then yeah. we react in anger. It's that crazy psycho psychology deal or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. You, you know, it's like, wow, I, they're modeling something that I taught them. And so you're really angry, but you know you see yourself in them. So that's one, they're, they pick up the negative behavior that you taught them, or they don't know something. And so you feel like you didn't equip them. And the truth is, you don't know. You didn't know what you're doing. And it's like, ah, oh, and you feel like this, they're, 
the way you felt like you didn't have the ability to, to come through because maybe your father didn't teach you something and you were clueless. And now you're passing down that, you know, quote, ignorance and your kids floundering and you're thinking, man, you better figure this out because the world's a tough place. You know, it's the guy that I told the story about having his kid down when he was asking for help with his algebra ended up with the guy on his kid, you know, shaking him by his collar saying, you got to figure this out. Well, this guy felt totally inadequate because, you know, he didn't know how to do math and he didn't know how to teach his son. Um, it, yeah, it's me in the, in the truck with my boys. I'm staring at a red light. We're sitting there and I'm telling them to knock it off. Right. And as I'm staring through the red light, <clears throat> they're fighting back and forth and finally end up spilling ice cream in the back. And man, I just start cussing. I pull the car over. I turn around and start flailing around. Well, yeah, they were, they were boys being boys and they should have, you know, knuckleheads. They should have knocked it off when I told them to, but they're kids and, they, and they're not mature. They're not grown. They're going to screw up. But, but, and, and yeah, I want to teach them to, to listen and to, to respect and all that. But the truth was the reason why I got so angry is because when I was sitting there staring a hole through the red light, I was playing over a scene that had happened at work where I felt embarrassed, where I'd been shamed in a meeting and boy, here's what I should have said. And all that pent up anger, it came out on my boys, right? And so I love what you see, you know, telling man, that wasn't about you. That was about me. Now you need to learn how to listen, right? We still got to teach our kids, but <clears throat> excuse me, when we blow it and we know we blew it and we know that what they did did not elicit the, the burst of rage, you know, from us that, that they got, we got to clean that up. But the more you do that and the more you look under the hood at what's going on and you catch yourself, you know, the trick is not to have to clean it up so much. The trick is getting ahead of it before it escalates into the burst of rage. And do you find hack in, in most of the people that you counsel, is that a big thing in, in that, and I guess, especially men, because we can be real knuckleheads and not, I mean, I didn't, it took me forever to piece this together that there's an underlying thing. That's why I'm angry all the time. Right. But is that something, especially in men that you find in these couples that you counsel that it, it really is, you've got to go back and look at some of the stuff that's happened to you in the past and understand why it shaped and molded you and made you into who you are. And, and that issue, especially with anger. Yeah. And men have been told, you know, suck it up, you know, don't cry, rub some dirt on it. Let's go. So they've been taught, don't look back. And it's, you're wasting your time. And a lot of people just think, well, hey, you know what? That's 30 years ago. How could that really be affecting me today? It's like, man, you tell me, right? It's the guy who today in a session of mine told me that a uh, babysitter had done some inappropriate things with him at five years old. And I was the second person on earth he told. Um, you know, here's this, uh, you know, he told his now ex-wife, right and unfortunately he did not get to the bottom of that and the way that wound played itself out uh it cost him his marriage and now he's looking back at things guess what his real father he never knew his stepfather was abusive and then you find out he had taken on the shame of some you know abuser right something that he had never told a, another soul on earth and yeah, you, you know, you're not going to tell me that, oh, just because that happened 45 years ago, that that didn't affect this man's entire life. It's the man that I talked to who told the story his entire life that his, his brother, he and his brother were horse playing on the roof while his dad was, was fixing the chimney and that he fell off. It wasn't until he sat in my office and he, he, he told the story that his father had gotten pissed off and threw him off that roof. And man, the psyche of a little 10 year old boy who had been, you know, playing with his, I guess, 12 year old brother. And, but the, the father threw him off that roof. So a, a father who's supposed to love and protect shamed him by actually throwing him off that roof. And it was something he covered to literally, um, you know, two decades into his, his marriage and how he medicated that pain with all kinds of inappropriate behaviors. And now that he's let that secret out, that deep, dark secret, and the shame is gone, he's a new man. 
his wife's like, oh my gosh, this is a, literally, it's like, we've never had a marriage like this. My, my husband's a new man. So yeah, we have to go back and look at that stuff. So dude, I know you and Jamie uh, have this incredible marriage now. And I don't, and I don't say that in any exaggeration. I mean, you really do, especially you look at where you were and then the, the chaos of, of, of all that was going on and how far you've come and how that's all come together. Tell people kind of how that, was there a moment in counseling or, or in that process that, that was a moment of healing and where it just totally became, you know, the time or was it a process to where slowly but surely through conversations, through conversation with Jamie, I mean, what did that look like for you as far as being able to overcome that anger yeah. in that relationship? I, I, it's a great question and I love it. And I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, how can I, you know, make this succinct here? It, but it's, it was a process, but I, there was defining moments all along. And so I remember, uh, so, so what I say is, you know, wow, I want to blow it to less degree. You know, when I was blowing it, so gosh, this just boom. So blow it to less degree and blow it less often, right? Less frequently. And so that feels like a win, you know? And then hopefully you're not blowing it at all, but you know, you're not perfect, but that's really how our marriage started progressing to where literally we, I'm just not that angry guy anymore. And, and when I feel something that I just starting to fester, I usually can do the, the self analysis and, and, you know, be conscious at a new level and not let it get to where I'm blowing up. And, uh, you know, the fear, the fear of finances back in the day when we were still raising all our kids were at home, you know, all that stuff can, can, you know, create anger. But the process was being honest, going to counseling, not being ashamed over these stories that when you felt like you were called a name or you were abandoned or embarrassed or, or what have you, um, betrayed. Uh, I remember one night after a fight, which again, my wife should have just given me the cold shoulder and, you know, called me a name and slammed the door like she had done before and gone to slept in another room. She laid there and she said, Brian, tell me about, and, and I, I, I'm going to keep this between us, but she said, just tell me about that. And it was something that she had been digging for and I never wanted to talk about. And it was ha happened with my family of origin and um, in a relationship with, with um, a parent and no, nothing, you know, heinous or, or you know, it, it, again, very traumatic, but it was something that had scarred me basically for life that I didn't want to share and I didn't want to open up about. And as my wife just kindly being the, basically a victim of my anger and my verbal assault, as she sat there and said, Brian, I want you to talk to me. I want to know about that. And man, the floodgates opened and I sat there and tears came and I started articulating the story and Jamie just put her arms around me and she just held me. And I'm telling you what, something supernatural broke in that day. Something happened, something in my spirit. And I thought, wow, there was a level of intimacy. My wife knew something that I felt like I had to hide before. And that, so that, I, you know, the counseling, that, the Kairos moment, uh, and then I can say making peace with your past that I did, doing the father, watching the father effect film, doing fathered by God and wild at heart with the John Eldridge stuff. You know, all of those things were very instrumental. I remember Trace Diaz, and then I went on a Z experience. So as I talk about all those things, you know, we could unpack them, but the, the point is it was a process. And as long as you're doing the work, God will take you through the right tools to reveal any residual basically lies that you're still believing about yourself and reveal the truth until all of a sudden man i feel like i'm the guy that god designed created in his image that's actually lovable and that's saved and that's a good husband and a good father you know and i don't have to hide and i don't have to cover up i'm like i'm not ashamed of this guy right well and i think too and I, well we got to wrap up here i know you got some stuff going on and places to be mm -hmm. but i think to your point i think that probably in that moment and tell me if i'm wrong the moment you had with jamie 
where you were able to truly be vulnerable and truly open up is probably a moment that obviously neither one of you will ever forget, but it's probably a moment that, that, that really took your marriage to a whole nother level. And even from an intimacy standpoint, it was the game changer in a lot of cases, right? It was a stake in the ground moment. Like never again, we're not going back here. Yes. It, it, it made me realize another human being can, can love you as you are, not as you should be. It being vulnerable with some human beings don't cost you judgment or shame. It was actually the most loving things, like fully known and fully loved, rather than not fully known and loved. That feels fraudulent. You know, I'm a fraud. Well, and it's and, that it's yeah. not believing that lie any longer that you can't be totally 100% vulnerable and open and honest with your wife because somehow that makes you look less of a man or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so what I would say kind of a, a, a kind of a closing deal for anger is learning that you've probably got something. If you're blowing it a lot in anger, you've probably got fear, shame, or, or sadness lurking you know, in the West, we don't know sadness at all. We don't grieve well, you know, uh, the, the shame part's hard for us to admit and look at. And then fear is just hard to admit when you're supposed to be the provider and the protector, you know, with all the testosterone. And so, but once you realize, okay, I've probably got fear, shame, or sadness, then it's a matter of, okay, so who are you going to talk to about it? Who are you going to open up and share with? Because when you share those things, they literally start to lose their power over you. Dude, I'll dig it. I dig it. Hey, tell people how they can reach you. I know you just, you're getting on the TikTok train and the fame and fortune of TikTok. Oh, baby. yeah. I got to get back on the content because that's crazy how when you're producing content, how, how many people were really following and liking and all that. So I'm a marriage coach. I'm just at marriage coach on TikTok. Uh, but you can search me, maybe even Brian Hackney and you'll pull up. But, uh, yeah, and, and I'm Brian H at crosstimberschurch.org. Uh, I'm also Brian Hackney at brianhackneycoaching.com. Sweet. And you got a book out there. I, I got that. I do. I do. That's actually, it's called Confessions of a Horrible Parent, The Art of Making Your Mistakes Matter. And you can get that on Amazon. You can get it on KDP, you know, Kindle. Uh, for, I can't remember what it is. As a matter of fact, I ran a promotion last month and I think 32 people took advantage of a free download on the, on the Kindle book. Yeah. Sweet. So that was cool. Yeah. Didn't translate to any sales, but <laughs> no, no, that, 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 that book said the hard copies out there on Amazon too. So, so yeah, it's called, uh, it's Brian Hackney and it's confessions of a horrible parent, the art of making your mistakes matter. I just, you know, I'd shared with so many parents over the years and, and how we learned to do things, you know, well with our kids was by screwing it up, you know? So God bless the third kid. He got the best parents, you know? Dude, I <laughs> and, love, I, and, I, hey, that's one of the few books I've read. <laughs> there you go. It's, just, it's an easy, it's an easy read. It's a quick one. And there so, you yeah, go, that's exactly. Why we're, that's why we're all better grandparents. You know, we figure this stuff out, so. Hack, I love you, brother. I always love hanging out with you, man. And we'll definitely reconnect again soon.